Acts chapter 16. If you want to go ahead and make your way over there. It is our midweek Bible study. So as you know, we are going through the book of Acts, our series uh, entitled Empowered. Again, I always like to remind with a title like that, uh, I want to try to disassociate myself to some degree with the charismatics. And what I mean by that is uh, when I say that we are empowered uh, and a lot of churches today, that might mean like, oh, it's all about you and you're the awesome one or whatever. No, it's just from Acts chapter one of verse eight, when Jesus said, you will be endued with power from on high to be witnesses of me. And so we should feel that God wants to empower us by his Holy Spirit to be a witness, to be a witness of him. And so whether that's just the words that we say or supernatural gifts or whatever it might be, let that be in his court. We just want to say we want to be used by you and be a witness for you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And I pray that this evening, as we continue our journey through the book of Acts, you would continue your journey through our heart, shaping it, molding it, changing it, purifying it, purging it. I pray that you would work over our heart and condition it as a potter conditions the clay in his hand with your Holy Spirit poured over like water. Let it soften us and make us useful vessels unto honor in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Uh, so last week we left off in Acts chapter. Actually, last week was spring break. So it was the week before in Acts chapter 15. It's one of my favorite chapters in the book of Acts. Uh, I've preached uh, several times, many times over the years from Acts chapter 15. I think it's a fascinating chapter. Uh, so right there, about in the middle of this book, uh, the church is in its early uh, years and its foundation time and you know the church that we are a part of. And in it, we find this great controversy. And when I say great, I don't mean good, meaning just a huge controversy. And of course, it was over whether or not the new converts who had been converted to Christianity needed to obey the law of Moses, namely the men be circumcised and all of them obey the law of Moses and kind of put them under the, the type of, of religion that the Old Testament Jews were under. Now, it was not necessarily a far-fetched idea for them to say, hey, shouldn't these new Christians get under the law? Because that was the way that you converted the Greeks, the whomever around you, to Judaism. You know, to be a proselyte, you had to go through all of these steps. And so now with Christianity being taught to the Jews as this is where God is now, what he's doing. There's a new covenant and this is the way that God is moving and working in his people now. And, you know, some Jews were receiving that. Uh, there were even some Pharisees that were receiving that. And so we found that once the Gentiles began to be converted, they weren't being converted in the same way that proselytes were meaning those who would become Jews prior to Christianity, they had to go through all of those steps. And with Christianity, now they're saying, hey, you can be in good with God and not have to do all that just by faith in Christ Jesus. And so that was a difficult thing. And so we find, again, anybody that goes to church regularly are going to find this thing keeps coming up constantly. Now, I didn't plan to keep talking about it, but it's what's in the, in the text as you go through. And so when we see this, it's really applicable more than we probably give it credit for. There's so many ways that the enemy wants to sneak in and try to get us out of harmony with God, walking by faith, walking in the spirit, but get some kind of alternate counterfeit religious type uh, methodology of, of, of living our lives that can so easily get us out of that harmony with God, out of walking by faith, out of uh, walking in the spirit and in walking in routines and patterns and such. Now, what happened was that these men came down from Judea to Antioch. Now, we know now that Antioch is really becoming, as we're moving forward in, in the book of Acts, Antioch is really becoming the hub for Christianity. 
The days of the church being, you know, headquartered in Jerusalem are numbered. In 70 AD, Jerusalem's going to be completely destroyed. And you know what? God knows it. <laughs> Jesus prophesied about it. So, and I think there's a lot of significance and efficiency in it. Because if you're trying to uh, establish a new covenant that is going to be with all people everywhere, then you might want to get it kind of a little bit away from the Jews. So get it out of Jerusalem and out of the Jewish religious system that's so dominant and make it more and bigger and greater than a Jew's religion. Then you can see why God might would want to start uh, moving a lot of, the, of the, the activity out of Antioch. And that really is uh, what's happening here. So now these guys came up from Judea and said, hey, y'all need to obey the law of Moses, you new converts, you Gentiles. And of course, we know that Paul and Barnabas said, I don't think so. That doesn't sound right. And so there was a big disagreement. Matter of fact, the text says there was no small disagreement. Uh, there, there was a huge disagreement. And so Paul and Barnabas said, hey, let's go to Jerusalem, because at that time, they're still uh, where the apostles were, James and the others, and said, let's go find out about the matter. So they go back to Jerusalem. And so what we find is a, is a great, no small dissension uh, there also, as there were people saying, yeah, they should obey the law of Moses and, and be circumcised. And so after great discussion, you know, Paul and Barnabas are, are kind of pleading that it doesn't seem like we should be putting this burden on the new disciples, uh, these Gentiles. And Peter kind of seconds that. He says, hey, you know, I was sent by God to be, you know, the witness to the Gentiles. And that's kind of my ministry. So I got some say so here. And he says, why would we put this burden uh, on the neck of the disciples that we couldn't even bear, nor our fathers bear? Why tempt you God? He said, you know, strong words. And then finally, James stand, uh, uh, speaks up and he says, uh, men and brethren, listen, this is my judgment on the matter. He says, we're not going to burden them with, with this uh, obeying the law of Moses and being circumcised. And so to make it official, they said, let's get a letter. We're going to write a letter. And in this letter, they say, hey, you know what? Um, uh, we know that people have kind of burdened you about obeying the law of Moses and being circumcised. He says, that's not from us. It seemed good with us and the Holy Spirit. So it's like complete official document here, you know, from the apostles. And this is from the apostles. We're in harmony with the Holy Spirit that that ain't us. That's not coming from us. And, and he said, we're going to send this letter as an official document by the hands of those who have hazarded their lives for the gospel, the men of great reputation and Paul and Barnabas uh, to go around and let everybody know, hey, this is the church's official position. Statement of faith. Go read it, read it on our website. Boom. Done in, in stone and ink and tablet. So uh, I want to pick up where we read last week in chapter 15, verse 30. And so these are being sent off with this letter, right? And so we read in verse 30 of chapter 15 of Acts. So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. Of course, they're coming right back where they came from. Uh, they were sent off from Jerusalem with this letter. And when they had gathered the multitudes together, they delivered the letter. 31. And when they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Awesome. This is good news. Great news. We've settled this debate. People don't have to get circumcised. The men do not have to get circumcised, the Gentiles, and they don't have to obey the law of Moses. Uh, you know, don't drink blood. Don't eat meats offered unto idols and, and don't commit sexual fornication. If you do these, you do well. There was this, this clear distinguishing that says, you know, we are not pagans anymore. So we are coming away from that. And they touched on these things because these were very pagan things. The eating and drinking blood and meats offered unto idols and fornication. Idolatry and worshiping other idols and sexual immorality and fornication and prostitution and the other religions all were to work together. And that's why they said we have no part of that. We're completely different than these pagan religions. That wasn't the end as Paul would continue and the other apostles would continue to say, hey, don't do this, do this, don't do that. There's, I mean, there is a lot of that as they're saying, hey, this is what it really should look like to uh, obey the Lord and to uh, walk in love and holiness. And so they rejoiced. Hey, look, good news. Verse 32. Now, Judas and Silas, these are a couple of guys that had been sent with them. 
themselves being prophets also, exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. Awesome. Great time happening there in Antioch. And after they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. So some of the men that were sent to help uh, kind of credit this letter, men had hazarded their lives for the gospel. Now they're being sent back kind of to give a report to the apostles of Jerusalem. But not everybody, as we will see. It says, however, it seemed, verse 34, however, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. And Paul and Barnabas also remaining in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Verse 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Okay, remember so far there's only been one missionary journey as far as Paul's missionary journey. And, and, and we, and we uh, started following that in Acts chapter 13 and chapter 14. And it was about a two-year mission. And, and so uh, we remember how they went on that mission. They kind of went all the way around and they came all the way back. And now it's been a little bit. And Paul is like, hey, Barnabas, let's go back and check on everybody. I mean, it's a good thing to do, right? You know, follow up with people that you've led to the Lord. Follow up with these churches that he had started. It would be a, a, the, the thing that anybody would do out of love. And it says, uh, now Barnabas... Verse 37, now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. Now, if you go back to Acts chapter 13, you will remember that in their first missionary journey, when they uh, uh, left Antioch and went uh, down to uh, the, the island of uh, Cyprus, uh, they did some missionary work there on the island of Cyprus. And then whenever they sailed north uh, to continue their mission, it says John Mark, you know, he's, he left them at that point. We don't really get a lot of information right then. It just says that he left them. But now we hear, and as we touched on a couple of weeks, we get insight that there was actually, it was not a, a, a really good deal. It wasn't just, hey, you know, Paul, or, you know, John Mark saying, hey guys, I got to go do this or whatever. We don't know the details, but evidently it, it didn't go over very well with Paul. Because again, verse 37, now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. So they left the island of uh, Cyprus. They sailed over to Pamphylia and then he turns around and goes all the way back. <laughs> And so evidently, maybe the decision was made on the boat, because I remember when we were reading this uh, uh, several weeks ago when we were doing that, it didn't say in the text whether he had left when they were leaving Cyprus or whether they had landed. And I forgot that it says this. It was after they landed. So he literally made that ship uh, trip kind of for nothing and just left from there. So maybe it happened on the ship. Um, and so he didn't continue with them. Verse 39, then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. So uh, this, is a, this is a very disturbing thing. And, uh, you know, church leaders and the, uh, theologians and scholars have, you know, disagreed about this for 2,000 years uh, on, on what really happened right here as far as who was right and who was wrong. And it's, it's really not even so much the point for me as much as it's a sad, heartbreaking thing that this, uh, you know, partnership that came to an end. Now, of course, we know when we read a letter that Paul writes to Timothy, he says, hey, send me John Mark. Uh, he's good for me for the ministry. So even if Paul thought, hey, you know what, you abandoned us and I don't want to take you on this missionary journey. Either Paul was wrong to do that and later on he got soft. Or he just thought, no, he's not ready yet. He's not mature enough. And later on, maybe John Mark had matured to the point where he'd be good for the uh, ministry. But evidently at this point, Paul's like, hey, you've abandoned us. And that's kind of, I still feel like you were there in that place in your life. It could happen. Now, you know, some people might would point to the fact that from this point on, you really don't hear anything about Barnabas. And the, the story in the book of Acts just follows now Paul and uh, him going on his second, third, and fourth missionary journeys. And so, uh, but, you know, to, to credit Barnabas, he didn't just say, okay, we're done and I'm going home. 
No, he says, I'm going to. And they, they went the way that Paul and Barnabas originally went on their first missionary journey. Barnabas now with his nephew, by the way, John Mark, a little nepotism there, nepotism. And he takes him with him. And that's where Paul and Barnabas had went originally. So they go to Cyprus. And so you can only imagine that Barnabas and, si uh, Barnabas and John Mark probably go where all those places they went with Paul the first time faithfully going in, loving on the church. So let's not, you know, uh, discredit that they were still used by God. Uh, and in Paul, he goes to the same place to some extent, but he goes now the northern way around. And so uh, it, the Bible says that uh, Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. Verse 40, but Paul chose Silas and departed. That's this new guy from Jerusalem, right? Uh, Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. Now, some people might would say, well, we see who had the blessing to the church. Well, it didn't say that they did not commend the other guys, but they definitely did commend uh, uh, Paul and Silas, although some might would conclude that that is a summarization of both, all, both teams commending them. By the grace of God. Verse 41. And he went through Syria. Now we're following Paul. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Chapter 16 and verse 1. Then he came to Derby. Now you remember he'd been there on his first missionary journey. He came to Derby and Lystra, both places he'd been. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy. And now we're getting introduced to Timothy of First and Second Timothy. And he was the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed... And so if she was a Jewish woman and she believed, the fact that they're saying that, that means she believed she was a Christian. You know, obviously a Jewish woman is a believer, but he's saying a Jewish woman who believed concerning the gospel. And, uh, but his father was Greek. And he was, verse 2, well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Iconium, remember, that's another one. Iconium, Lystra, and Derby, they're all there real close together. And Paul wanted to have him go on with them. So isn't that cool? You know, you pick up a new brother, brother to go with you on your missionary journeys. So now let's just take that in for a second. When Paul writes his letters to Timothy, remember Timothy was a road warrior with him. They have a, they have a history. And uh, Timothy had kind of cut his teeth under Paul and, and, and you know, and had, had some, uh, some miles on him. So uh, Paul wanted to have him go on with him and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. Wow. That is, that is really interesting given all that we just covered in chapter 15. This huge, I mean, Paul was ready to fight to the death to keep Gentiles from having to be circumcised. And what does he do? After he goes down and he shares down with the church of Jerusalem, the church of Jerusalem is like, yeah, you don't have to be circumcised. Boom. Hey, we're going to make a letter about it. Boom. Go pass the letter around. Boom. And what's Paul do? He grabs Timothy and goes circumcising. You know, uh, I have heard some teachers, a, a friend of mine, in fact, but not, not only him, um, who, who taught that Paul sinned here in circumcising Timothy. Now, I think that it'd be wrong for us to uh, automatically assume that Paul never sinned. I don't think he sinned here at all. Um, some people that don't think he sinned here think maybe he did sin back there with Barnabas and he was being unmerciful or whatever. Let's put it this way. Let's not make our judgment on the fact that we think Paul never sins. That's not it. He's not Jesus. But I don't believe he sinned here at all. I believe that those that would look at this and say, man, look at all you accomplished. And the first thing you do, you go undo it by circumcising somebody. You just went and made a big deal about not having to circumcise anybody. And, and, and now you're doing it just because some Jews that live in the area. And um, I think we really miss the point if we do it that way. And so, you know, I want to read these next two verses. And he and, and as they went through, verse 4, and I'm going to come back to this. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep. What decrees? The letters that say you don't have to be circumcised. Uh, is, is there an inconsistency here? Some people think so. 
and which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So this is the official letter. It says you don't have to be circumcised, among other things, but you don't have to be circumcised, and Paul's carrying that around. So in him, there's no conflict, obviously. He would be abandoning the letter if he had, if he had backslid from thinking that Jews, uh, Gentiles don't have to be uh, circumcised. But in, there, these are harmonious with him. This is not a compromise one or the other. And it says in verse 5, So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in numbers daily. So here's the thing. Why in the wide world of sports would Paul go and circumcise Timothy? Well, I want us to turn, you know, we're in Acts. So let's just go over to the next book. That's Romans. Romans chapter 14. I want us to read something. Romans chapter 14. And we're going to pick up in, in verse 14, Romans chapter 14, verse 14. This is Paul writing again. And this, this is much later. He says this, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean to him and is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Let's, let's think about this for a moment. You know, I, I was tempted as we've been going through the book of Acts. And the first several chapters, I was just doing, you know, chunks of verses at a time. And I reached a point where we were able to take chapters at a time, which is pretty awesome. And I could have just tried to get all of chapter 16 in. And I, I, although I do like being able to cover a whole chapter in a session, I don't want to compromise and miss anything that's really important and critical. And this is one that I do believe we will take an aside for. I won't cover any more of Acts chapter 16. I might be able to get the rest of it next time. But this right here, before we go any further, why in the world did Paul circumcise Timothy when he believed he didn't have to? Whenever, whenever the, the, the de decree and the ruling from the churches is that you didn't have to. And we find it in a lot of Paul's writings elsewhere. We also find it in the words of Jesus Christ. And we find it in the Apostle John is that there's something more at work here than the law and uh, what you should do according to even the decree. You know, because some people could have said, we have the decree right here. It says we don't have to be circumcised. And that's what Paul could have just used. But the thing is, is that legalism is not just going around and saying, I won't do this and I won't do that. I won't do this. And you think of all the thou shalt nots and I won't do any of them. But legalism is just working the law to your advantage. And so some people are very legalistic like this decree right here, people wave over and say, we don't have to do certain things. We are under liberty, under law, and somehow they have no love towards the brethren. And in that, they pass over loving their brother to stand in their liberty, and that is still legalism. They're saying, I can legally do this. I can legally drink, or I can legally say a cuss word or I can legally this that you know whatever people may just find their mind that they can do legally because of the they're under liberty they're just working your legality which is still legalism you're abusing your liberty here we find that and we find this in other places too where there's a controversy over what people can eat and what they can't, what they should eat and what they shouldn't, what they can and should drink. And, and, and some people are very much offended. We know from 1 Corinthians, we may get there tonight, where there was idols being, uh, there were meats being offered, there were idols being worshipped, and there were meats being offered under these idols and then taken and sold the next day in the marketplace. And Christians were like, ooh, that looks like a good piece of meat right there. And they go and buy it. And somebody else might be saying, hey, that was sacrificed to an idol last night. And the Christian's like, well, I didn't sacrifice it to an idol. And it looks good to me. I'm going to go and eat it. And then the other brother would be like, how can you eat this meat that was offered unto an idol? And uh, I've actually shared this with people before in Bible studies. And I kind of led with that instead of set this whole background first. 
And I say, would you eat meats that were offered up to idols? And I, just, just starting the Bible study that way, and a lot of people would be like, no way, I'm not going to eat some meat that was offered up to an idol. And then when we get in the text, uh, it goes on that Paul says, that's not a problem. It's not that there's something contaminated or sinful about the meat. He said, if it offends somebody. So in Paul's examination of it, he says, yeah, you can eat it, you know, but if you, somebody's there is going to be offended by it and you know they're going to be offended by it and you eat it, it means you don't love your brother very well. And so loving is really what determines what we should and shouldn't do. Not by the Old Testament and not by the New Testament and not by this decree that Paul is carrying around in his hand. See, he, he's not going to use that for legalism to say, I can do this, or just like legalism would be for I can't do something. It's about what is best, what is most loving. So reading this again in chapter 14 of Romans in verse 14, I know and I am convinced, Paul says, that there's nothing unclean of itself. So this meat or whatever that we might eat, it's not unclean. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved, verse 15, because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Okay, now let's, let's, let's use this in a way that um, might be a little more closer to home. Um, I, I, I was, had some friends that they had read and somebody had shared with them or whatever about something from the Old Testament about eating shellfish. And these are New Testament Christian friends of mine. And they uh, said, I'm not going to eat any. We, stopped, we like shrimp and we like crabs and we like, but we stopped eating them because something that was said to them by a pastor or a preacher that wasn't even somebody that believes in the law, but somehow brought that in somehow and used it. And so they said, well, I'm not going to eat that. And so, you know, Although I, I did take an opportunity to try to instruct them better in the truth, and they eventually saw it and, and said, yeah, okay. And they started eating crabs and shrimps again. I wanted to make sure that they had a clear conscience between them and God on that matter. But in the beginning, I just didn't eat, I didn't eat uh, shrimp with them or crabs. The, it, it was a little process. You know, you don't just go pick somebody's brain. If they flip around that quickly, maybe they were... Maybe they're a little flippy floppy anyway, but I, I kind of slowly over a little time in our relationship began to instruct them this way. I'd barely known them at the time anyway, so I didn't want to just sit down and, you're crazy, can't eat no crabs. No, you know, I was being loving with them. And so eventually we were able to eat crabs with them. So, but my point is, is that um, I didn't eat that in front of them, even though I know that I can eat crabs. I know that I can eat shrimp. I know all that, but it could have hurt them. They weren't there yet. They're there now, but they weren't there yet. And so being loving and merciful to them is, is the name of the game for Christianity, is being loving. And so if we, don't, if we just did abuse our liberty, Paul says, you're no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one who, for whom Christ died. Those are some heavy words. This is how serious it is. That we, uh, that Paul would say, you destroy them. Now that's strong, strong words. You'd be like, I'm not destroying them. Well, Paul says you destroy them. And if that's not strong enough, he's strong enough. He says, for whom Christ died. Now he's dropping the destruction of them and, and the death of Christ on there to say, this is huge. This is no small thing. He says, so uh, verse 13, 16, therefore, don't let your good be spoken of as evil. That's another phrase in context is appropriate that sometimes we do what we do based on, is it good for the gospel? Is it good for my brother or is it good for me? And so that's, uh, we come to this now uh, in, in a very uh, relevant situation, because as we continue to read, Paul says, whether it's drinking or eating or whatever, if it offends your brother, then don't do it. And so we come to the issue of, of alcohol. I am not one of those preachers who uh, believe that the, that the Bible teaches that you can't drink alcohol. 
The Bible clearly says not to be drunk. And some preachers can read between the lines and find things that ain't in the text and say to drink alcohol is a sin. I don't believe that. Try to say that all the wine back then was not fermented. I don't believe that. It was drunkenness back then. So it was fermented going around. And so the thing is, is that, uh, and so because of that, I don't believe that drinking alcohol is a sin. But I don't drink alcohol. And I don't drink alcohol for the same reason that, uh, th that I wouldn't eat meats under, offered unto idols. Because it might cause someone to stumble. It, it might offend them. And so I know there are plenty of people out there in the church that would not be offended if they saw you, me drinking a glass of wine. Or they might not be offended if they saw me drinking a beer. And uh, they might be like, well, you can drink wine, but don't drink beer, Steve. Okay, you can drink beer, but don't you be drinking no liquor, Steve. And we just all have our legalistic line wherever we put it. But the reality is, is that in our country, namely in the United States of America and other countries as well, um, alcohol is considered, uh, general knowledge considered as a sin amongst uh, Christians and has been for a long time in our country. Now, it's not as much as it used to be, but it, it was for a long time. And so there are still a lot of people who view Christians as non-drinkers. Even the people that are in the world that say, I don't, I, I mean, I drink alcohol, but I know Christians don't. And they might think, well, that's silly of them. But when they see a Christian drinking, what will they do? They'll say, well, they're not a Christian because Christians don't drink alcohol. Of course, I know that to be a fact for a lot of people. It's not going to offend everybody, but it'll offend enough, especially in this part of the country, especially in the South. I can tell you right now that if I went down to Chili's and I had me a mixed drink or a beer, there'd be people that would struggle with that in our community. Do you agree with that? There would be people. Um, is that their problem? No, it's my problem too. I mean, I know it's not a sin, but if I didn't care, it'd be my problem. And if they're not there, if they, if they ha have an issue with it, um, I'm out of love, not going to drink for them. Now, some people might say, well, that's your call. You're, I understand it maybe as a preacher, maybe as a pastor in the community. You can't really do it. You're going to offend people. Well, you know, I hope that, that you and those watching online are establishing such a, uh, a presence in your communities, in your homes, in your, amongst your co-workers, in your families, that those who drink and think drinking is a sin, and they, they're convinced you're a Christian, that that's not the most important thing you do is you go right up to and say, hey, you know, <laughs> you know, I can drink as a Christian and try to establish that as if it, that's the important part of the gospel or something. Um, but uh, I believe there are some people who are not pastors who are saying, you know what? I still am aware that me drinking alcohol can cause other people to stumble and they may not want to hear the gospel from me. Now, there are some people in the church say, I can drink alcohol in a church, but then you don't have any kind of evangelistic ministry anyway, so maybe you ain't hurting anybody with it. But you need to consider the fact that you don't have any evangelistic ministry in your heart. You're missing the call. Like, I mean, well, somebody, somebody put a, 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 a post on Facebook today uh, uh, asking, uh, was we called to, uh, how was it? Uh, are we called to make disciples or a difference? And now I, I love the connections that were made between that. Obviously, a disciple would make a difference, but Jesus said, go make disciples. And so that is what our, all of our responsibility is, right? To go make disciples it means we all should be evangelistic. And willing to make sacrifices to be more evangelistic. What is expedient? What is efficient? What is best for sharing the gospel and spreading the gospel? And Paul says, it's not about what you can get away with. It's about what's going to help the gospel. You know, I, uh, again, I don't drink alcohol. But even if I wasn't a pastor and people thought it was a sin, I still probably wouldn't be drinking alcohol because I have been involved in ministry long enough and plan to continue uh, being involved in ministry while out where I will be interacting in the lives of a recovered alcoholic. They're all around us and they cannot have a, a sip of alcohol. They can't just sit down and have a drink. And I can tell you that there are people who have recovered or recovering from alcohol who um, can do it 
as long as they help the environment and, and select the environment they're in. And I can tell you that I believe a pastor who drinks or even a Christian who drinks around someone who can't drink might tempt them to drink. Uh, there was an instance where there was a couple, and, and I'll never forget this, it just really devastated me because the husband was a bad alcoholic and he was doing everything that he could. This was probably 10 years ago or so. He was doing everything he could. He was trying, trying to quit drinking alcohol. His wife was not an alcoholic. She liked to have her wine or a little drink or whatever. And she would not stop her pleasure drinking and social drinking for her husband. She said, I don't have a problem. I should be able to have my wine. I should be able to have. So she's bringing alcohol into the house of an alcoholic and put it in front of him all the time saying, it's not my problem. It's not my fault. I, I should be able to drink alcohol. If I want to have a glass of wine, I should be able to have a glass of wine, even though she, she says, yeah, you need to stop because she's an alcoholic. But to me, how unloving is that? Where's the sacrifice, right? Where's the sacrifice that she should be willing to make uh, to, to help her husband who's weaker? Yeah, maybe she's stronger than him. She can drink and I'm becoming a drunk, but he can't. And I just, I could not wrap my mind around how unloving that was. And that's very much like what Paul is saying. He's saying, if you love, you will make whatever sacrifices to try to help others walk who might be weaker than you to still to walk. That is what's happening with these Jews that Paul wants to minister to and why he would, he would have Timothy be circumcised because he knows there's going to be so many Jews and they know Timothy's dad's a Gentile. They, know now, they now know Timothy's running around with Paul and this is all in the area where Timothy's known and he's running around with Paul. And so now he's got this new Jews Christian uh, Christianity. And Paul's going to go along and try to do what he's always been doing and convince the Jews through the scriptures that the Messiah would die on a cross and, and, you know, convince them of Christianity. And they're going to be struggling with this Gentile over here. And, uh, and uh, I mean, I, it, it's, it's a funny thing, but Jews needed to know if a Gentile was circumcised. I don't know how they walked through that, but they needed to know. And maybe they just counted on your honesty about it. But Paul wanted to just make it easier and more efficient to spread the gospel by just, you know what, you don't need to. But it, it can be a real shutting down for them whenever you, as an uncircumcised person, can't come into their house. You can't, I mean, so many things, right, that would cause an issue. And, you know, uh, Paul was like, I have this document, but I'm not going to be legalistic about it. I love the Jews so much that I'm willing to make sacrifices. Now, here's the thing. Who made the bigger sacrifice? Timothy made the bigger sacrifice, but Timothy loved. He knew he didn't have to. He didn't have to be circumcised, but he loved the brethren, the Jews. He, he, you know, he was half Jew, but he was still, he loved the brethren. He loved the gospel. He loved Jesus so much. He says, if it's going to further the gospel, I mean, you probably could imagine people might've sat down and says, is it going to further the gospel? Is it ain't going to further the gospel? And if, if it's even a chance, I think Timothy's like, let's do it. Let's do it. Now, I might would think that Timothy would say, but we can have a little wine first, right? I don't know. Maybe, maybe he might would be thinking that, oh, okay, let, let me get back to my place. Romans chapter 14 again. But now we're seeing that, that Paul understood, even with this legal document that he had in his hand, he says, it's not even about that. It's about love. So again, in chapter 14, he says, verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue things which make for peace and things by which one may edify one another. And evidently, Timothy agreed with that, right? He said, let's, let's make what makes for peace and edifies. Do not destroy the work of God. There's that phrase again. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Meaning I can eat this and I can drink that. I can eat meats that's been offered unto idols. And Paul said, yeah, you can. 
But if you do it, knowing it hurts somebody who's not really mature as you are, um, you're destroying them. And he continues to say, you're walking in sin. Uh, what wasn't a sin is now a sin. Eating meats offered unto idols is not a sin. Eating it knowing it causes somebody to stumble is a sin. Drinking alcohol is not a sin. Drinking alcohol knowing that can cause somebody to stumble is a sin. It means because you're not walking in love. That is what makes sin and not sin. And what makes sin sin is not loving. Loving God or loving one another. Again, verse 20, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat or drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. I want us to read one more passage and then we will we will close this out. First Corinthians, keep now you just keep going, you just keep going, right? First Corinthians chapter eight. So we're just doing Acts, Romans, and First Corinthians chapter eight. And this is what we, we talked about and I mentioned earlier, First Corinthians chapter eight. Uh, Paul says this a lot in First Corinthians. Now concerning this matter or that matter. He's actually going, and sometimes it says things that you wrote to me about. Uh, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, a lot of Paul's writings. He's writing addressing issues that were written to him. We don't have the letters they wrote to him, but we got his responses. He says, now concerning things offered to idols, Acts, or 1 Corinthians 8 and 1. Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Okay, there's a contrast here. And what are the two? Into the spectrum, law or, or knowledge, excuse me, knowledge and love. And I know what I can do and what I can't do. I know I can drink alcohol. I know I can eat meats offered unto idols. I know I can say this word or that word or watch this and do that. And what there's so much. And I say that because we see Christians nowadays and they engage in things that, yeah, maybe the Bible doesn't say they're wrong. But we know they are offensive. And we see our Christians today that just are just reveling in their liberty. And that's legalism. They're saying, it's legal, I can do it. And, it, and it, it's offensive to other people. That's still legalism. Again, let's not limit legalism to just saying, these are the things that I won't do. Abusing the things that you can legally do is still working legalism. So... What is the contrast? Knowledge and, and, and love. Verse 2. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, that's the knowledge, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. You ain't as knowing as you think you are. He says in verse 3, but if anyone loves, there's the contrast, God, this one is known by him, known by God, um, who, the one who loves. And, you know, loving is greater than knowledge. There are a lot of people who have knowledge without love. Again, I know I can drink and I have this great knowledge. I know I can do this or that. I have this great knowledge and lack love for those that are being hindered by that. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. Again, coming back to this issue that, you know, they would offer meats unto idols, not Christians, but the pagans, you know, the, the, the Greeks. They would offer these meats up to the different idols uh, and uh, Princess Diana or whatever, not Wonder Woman. Prince, uh, but, uh, but they, and they would, after their, their services and their worshiping was over, uh, the goddess Diana, I guess I should say, they would take that meat down to the marketplace and just sell it. It was perfectly good meat. But again, some Christians might even today be like, I ain't eating that meat. Well, you get poor enough, you'd be like, okay, maybe it's not a sin. I'm going to eat that meat. You know, you get hungry enough, you, all of a sudden your religion changes. And, and so Paul's saying, it's just meat. That's what Paul's position is clearly, it's just meat. He has this knowledge, but he's going to say, but love. Therefore, concerning, again, verse four, therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know knowledge. And an idol is nothing in the world, but there's no other God but one God. We as Christians know there's only one God. 4 verse 5, for even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us, verse 5, there's one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through him, through whom we live. 
However, we have this great knowledge. We are, are, we have one God and we do not worship these other gods and it's just meat. And if I'm hungry, I want to eat it. I want to feed it to my family. It's just meat. Verse seven. However, Paul says, there is not in everyone that knowledge, this great knowledge and understanding. There's not in every Christian out there, the knowledge that alcohol is not a sin. They grew up with grandma saying, don't be drinking alcohol, it's a sin. They grew up maybe in churches where they said, alcohol is a sin, alcohol is a sin. So their mind, it's a sin. And they see you drinking, what do they see? They see you sinning. And then they, what, are going to receive the gospel from you? No, it's not going to be efficient at all. And so he says, there, there is not in everyone, verse 7, that knowledge. For some, with conscience of the idol, until now, eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food does not commend us to God. It ain't going to make us any better to God. For neither if we eat it, are we the better? Or if we not, do not eat it, are we the worse? But beware, lest someone, how this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge, you're like, you know, eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And even though they feel like it's wrong, they might turn around and start eating it. And they don't even have the, have the knowledge. They literally, they will, this happens. Somebody may not feel at peace that something that they're going to do. And I want you to really think about this. Some people may not have the peace about doing a particular thing and it being okay with God. And they see somebody who's more mature or stronger Christian doing that said thing. And then they say, you know what? I can do it too. And they still don't have that peace in their heart, but they do it because you're doing it. And you may even have knowledge that they don't have that peace. And I have seen this happen where somebody might would bring that person along, convince them to do something and think, well, it's not a sin. So it's okay. Well, they don't have that faith. The Bible says that it's still a sin. And I have to go back to Romans chapter 10 for that, or uh, Romans chapter 8. Matter of fact, anything that is not done in faith is sin. Uh, that would be Romans chapter 14 at the end of that. But he says, um, verse 11, And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish, for whom Christ died. There he drops that again. You know, uh, but that's what he said in Romans, remember? That's the way he tied it in. He says, these are for whom died, Christ died. He says, God died for this person that you're so quickly, easy to destroy. He says, God died, Jesus Christ died for them. He says, I want you to know the value of this thing that you're bringing to destruction, Paul's terms, perishing, Paul's terms. What God died for, Jesus Christ died for. And verse 12, when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother to stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother to stumble. Now, I have a feeling after that, Paul still ate meat. His point is, if there's somebody who's going to be offended, I won't do it. You know, if he's, if he's out and about and he's traveling by himself and there's, you know, he's, he's hungry, there's a sandwich shop, got some roast beef in it, you know, would he probably eat it? Probably so. If he had met somebody along the way, he thought it might offend him, I ain't going to eat it. Why? Because he's ruled by love. See, Paul made this big deal to fight against legalism, but didn't become legalistic himself, always maintaining that we walk in love. And that's why he would even say to Timothy, you know, hey, what do you think about getting circumcised? Maybe Timothy said, it. maybe Timothy said, hey, maybe I should just get circumcised. Wouldn't it be a lot easier? We don't get the background for it. Maybe Timothy and Paul were talking about it. Like, hey, how do we handle Timothy? You know, he's a Greek, you know. He's not going to be able to go into the, you know, probably into the synagogues and into certain places. Uh, what should we do? Maybe Timothy said, but circumcise me, man. It's about the gospel. I don't know how the circumcision, I don't know how the conversation went, but um, evidently, you know, there was a willingness on Timothy's part saying, I love uh, these Jews even, and I want to be a blessing to them and help them uh, to be able to receive the gospel. And if they might not hear it because you're carrying around a Gentile with you, you know, a Greek with you, then phew, circumcise me let's get this thing done so we can get the gospel i mean how 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 awesome is that that they're sacrificing 
is nothing for a Christian. I mean, that's what we do. It's everything. And by that, I'm saying we wouldn't hesitate. We're quick to say what's quickest, what's best, what's most efficient. And that's why Paul said, all things are lawful unto me, but not all things are profitable. He says, I can do anything. It's not about, uh, you know, I, 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 it's about the gospel for me. What's going to further the gospel? I'm not going to sit back and say, hey, can I drink or not? And say, how good is that for the gospel? If it's not good for the gospel, I won't drink. And if we would have that attitude, it'd be helpful. So uh, next week we'll pick up again, following Paul and Silas on their journey. But anytime the scriptures deal with this, and it happens a lot, the scripture calls this out. I think we as a church should revisit it. It should be something that with anything that we are learning and teaching and preaching, it should be something that we, through repetition, cover this again and again. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. And Lord, I pray that you would see in us a people who are quick to sacrifice and do anything that you would have us to do and to be so focused on the gospel that it dictates and determines what we do and what we don't do. Our love for you and for one another dictates what we do and what we don't do. And in this, we find uh, the true commandment of God that we would love you with all our heart and love each other as ourselves. And in this, we fulfill, as Jesus said, and the apostles confirmed, we fulfill all the law, all the prophets, all the expectations of God and loving you and loving one another. In Jesus' name, amen.